We've talked about the capabilities of Denovian ground-based ballistic missile and long-range precision fires weapon systems, but we haven't discussed the tactics and strategies that govern how they're employed on the battlefield. In this episode, we fix that. Hello and welcome. I am your host, and this is 35 Fox Talks. When we study how ballistic missiles are employed, we find it is beautifully simple. The strategy of ballistic missiles can be looked at in three buckets. During competitive cooperation and adversarial competition, the mission of ballistic missiles is to show ranges and interdiction evasion capabilities that instill concern in the adversary. By making adversaries believe they have ineffective defenses, Ballistic missiles become a deterrence measure that keeps adversaries from becoming too aggressive. Having capable missiles also makes adversaries invest money and time in developing countermeasures that can act as a drag on the economy, detract from the readiness of general military forces, and deplete a defensive force's morale. Now because of the impact ballistic missiles have on the strategic psyche of adversaries, they are almost automatically high value and high payoff targets and thus need to be employed in such a way as to avoid preemptive strikes and avoid counter-ballistic missile systems. So first and foremost, launchers need to be dispersed to avoid losing them all to one strike. Second, they need to be garrisoned closer to the middle of the country to maximize the amount of time an enemy counter-ballistic missile strike can be detected and defeated. Third, they need to be forward positioned enough to designated targets to strike them on short notice. Fourth, they need to be mobile enough to shoot and scoot so they can hide, fire, run away from counter-strikes, and hide again. Bucket number two. During proxy wars, ballistic missiles typically operate in semi-static positions because the risk of counter-strike is low, while the need to be precise in firing is high. Even if ballistic missiles are not used in a proxy war, their open appearance can serve to signal a willingness to increase hostilities. Therefore, ballistic missile launchers can often be seen firing from known garrison launch pads, known field training sites, or well-established and improved field launch sites. Regarding command and control, ballistic missile operations in this bucket are typified by highly centralized control, typically at the national level so operations don't cause unintended consequences, like escalating the conflict out of control. Bucket number three. Limited objective war and total war situations add a sense of chaos. That's because ballistic missiles must play shell games to both hit their targets and avoid counter-strikes. Close-range ballistic missiles and short-range ballistic missiles don't really do this outside of typical artillery TTPs of in place, fire, displace, and hide, and reload because they tend to be more numerous and have a more tactical to operational impact instead of operational to strategic impacts. Medium, intermediate, and intercontinental ballistic missiles, on the other hand, must play a cat-and-mouse game of hide-and-seek. To do this, they must disperse from their garrisons in multiple directions, preferably shortly before the start of hostility so ISR doesn't have time to find all of them in their hide sites if they leave too early. Or, alternatively, preemptive strikes don't destroy them while they are still in garrison because they left too late. Once these ballistic missiles leave, they move to pre-designated hide sites where landline communications, fuel, food, and additional missiles are located for reloading. Now, once upon a time when liquid-fueled rockets were the norm, there was this whole step-by-step -step process that had to be followed along a strict timeline. That is not the case for modern solid-fueled rockets. Modern ballistic missiles move to these hide sites and wait to launch their missiles within minutes of the order to fire. Their hide sites can be railroad tunnels, highway tunnels, covert bunkers, thick forests, or buildings with retractable roofs in urban areas. Typically, hide sites are not launch areas, but in some cases, like the retractable roof buildings, they are. When the order to fire is received, Ballistic Missile Transport Erector Launcher, TEL, crews drive to a suitable launch area that is level enough and has enough vertical clearance to accurately fire. TEL crews must also have a good idea of where they are located in order to do the correct trajectory calculations should GPS guidance of their missiles be unavailable. TELs must then either return to their original height site or move to an alternative area of concealment if they believe their position is compromised by ISR. 
TELs must then make their way back to various reload sites. The areas where ballistic missile operations occur outside of garrisons are called field operating areas. Again, in decades past, launching ballistic missiles used to take hours. However, the firing sequence for modern ballistic missiles is less than 30 minutes and typically dictated by crew proficiency and drive times between launch sites and hide sites. Now some of you might have caught on that the hide sites can be critical target system components or critical target elements. While true, remember that adversaries know this as much as you, which means they've taken this into account in modern ballistic missile operations. Ballistic missile batteries have four main components. TELs to move independently around the FOA and fire missiles, transport and reloader vehicles to independently hide and then link up with TELs, command and control vehicles for mobile communication should landlines be lost, and supply mainly fuel trucks to sustain operations. This means that within an FOA, if a fixed hide site becomes untenable, ballistic missile batteries can disperse across a wide area and conduct sporadic linkups for fuel and reloading, making effective targeting all the more difficult. Now, circling back around to those more tactical, close, and short-range ballistic missile systems, there is something important you should remember as an analyst. These systems can be as close to the forward edge of the battle area, FIBA, as the enemy commander wants. As analysts, we have this tendency to think CRBMs and SRBMs will stay in the rear areas for their own safety, and while this may be doctrinally true, in combat their employment is based on the enemy commander's mission requirements and tolerance for risk. Remember that these systems are mobile, so if the enemy commander thinks he gains an advantage by having CRBMs and SRBMs drive forward to strike targets as deep as possible before driving back to rear areas to reload, then they will do so. Remember, doctrine is just a recommended way of fighting, not the hard truth of how the enemy will fight. In our next episode, we get more philosophical as we discuss what is the role of the 35 Fox. Until then, thanks for watching, take care, and God bless. Thank you.